everyone, and thank you for watching this recorded presentation. Uh, before we get started, let me introduce myself. My name is Chase Dubois, and I'm a post-baccalaureate researcher. I work in the Anxiety and Stress Lab at UNC, and also in the Duke Behavioral Health and Technology Lab. And I'm also a volunteer at a wonderful organization called Helping Give Away Psychological Science, or HGAPS for short. And it's focused on dissemination of high quality psychological research and resources in psychology. And I'm actually gonna be helping give away some psychological science here today by sharing information about a really great and free assessment later on in the talk. So stay tuned for that. And I just wanna share a quick content warning with you all. Um, so I'm gonna discuss some pretty heavy topics here today. And if that's not something that you're up for hearing about, please feel free to skip this video. I won't hold it against you, but if you'd like to stay, you're more than welcome to. All right, so what are we gonna be talking about today? So this talk is gonna be structured in two parts. First, I'll tell you all about a research project that I led that was focused on how different types of trauma relate to childhood PTSD symptoms. Then we're gonna switch gears a little bit and I'm gonna share some information about a really great assessment that was used in that study and that you can begin using today right here after you watch this presentation if you choose to. And also please feel free to scan this QR code if you'd like to receive a copy of the slides. And I'll also put this code up at the end of the presentation if you'd like to download them then. All right, so let's dive into the introduction. So childhood trauma and PTSD are surprisingly common. More than two thirds of children report experiencing a traumatic event by the time they're 16 years old, and about five to 16% of those trauma exposed children and adolescents end up developing PTSD. Yet trauma histories and symptoms are often not identified and the cost of missing them is really high. So children often don't disclose that they've experienced a trauma independently, and most broadband assessments like the child behavior checklist and others don't include PTSD assessment. Moreover, PTSD includes symptoms that are common to many other disorders, like changes in mood, avoidance, and arousal that are reminiscent of anxiety, and also cognitive symptoms that could disrupt attention and look like an attention disorder. And it's basically like you just ripped a bunch of pages out of DSM, threw them in a blender, and made a little DSM smoothie. You've got a lot going on that comes from a lot of different disorders, so it can be really hard to identify. And PTSD symptoms in children and adolescents can be pretty distressing and also have really long-lasting consequences. So this is something that you want to catch early on, and knowing which children have a higher risk can help you detect it and provide them with targeted treatments. Now, interpersonal traumas, which are traumas inflicted by another person, have been associated with greater post-traumatic stress symptoms than non-interpersonal traumas, which are caused by things like natural disasters or accidents. And the current research project will be focusing on interpersonal traumas. And while there's a clear difference in PTSD severity between interpersonal versus non-interpersonal traumas, are there differences in severity between different types of interpersonal traumas? So likely, yes, but these differences are not as clear cut. So our project focused on three main types of interpersonal traumas, sexual abuse, physical abuse, and neglect. And overall, it's not very clear whether any of these trauma types differentially confer increased risk of PTSD symptoms, especially when looking at studies of youth. And while there's been some evidence to suggest that they do, findings have been pretty mixed across studies. So out of these three, sexual abuse seems to have a more consistent link to PTSD symptom severity than physical abuse or neglect. And then another trauma history that's worth examining is polyvictimization, which just describes having a history of multiple different types of traumas. So for example, having a history of sexual abuse and neglect. And in adolescents and adults, 
Holly victimization has been consistently associated with especially severe PTSD symptoms compared to experiencing a single trauma type. But further exploration is needed to see if this extends to younger children. So based on all of this, for the current study, we wanted to clarify the relationships between different types of interpersonal traumas and PTSD symptom severity. And although the findings in the literature were pretty mixed, we did have a few hypotheses based on what we found. So first, we hypothesized that all of the trauma types would predict increased PTSD symptom severity. Second, that sexual abuse in particular would predict greater severity than physical abuse or neglect. And then finally, that poly victimization would predict the greatest symptom severity. And we also wanted to look at re-experiencing avoidance and arousal PTSD symptom clusters to see if any of these were predicted by certain traumas. There was very little prior research on this, so we opted to examine them in an exploratory manner. All right, so let's get into what we did for the analyses. So these were secondary analyses of data collected from a sample of outpatient youth aged 8 to 18. And trauma history was identified using a combination of medical records, Department of Children and Family Services records, and interviews with both the youth and their caregivers. And to measure PTSD symptoms, children completed the Child PTSD Symptom Scale, or CPSS, which is a free measure of PTSD symptoms in youth with trauma histories. And it provides a total score of PTSD symptoms, as well as subscales for each of the symptom clusters. And that is the measure that I'm going to highlight towards the end of the talk. So stay tuned if you want to learn a little bit more about it in a few minutes. All right, so for the analyses, we use multiple regression, first creating a model to test whether different types of trauma predicted total scores on the CPSS, and then creating a model for each of those CPSS symptom cluster subscales. And all of our models included gender, race, and ethnicity as covariates, and we also calculated partial R as a measure of effect size. So here's what we found. Interestingly, sexual abuse was the only trauma type that significantly predicted increased PTSD symptom severity. And you can see on this violin plot that the sexual abuse violin is taller, meaning that it is higher in symptom severity than the others and it had a small but significant effect size. And if you recall from our hypotheses earlier, we expected that all the trauma types would predict increased severity, so this was surprising. But we did expect that sexual abuse would predict greater severity than physical abuse or neglect, so this finding aligns with our hypotheses in that respect. And interestingly, we did not find that polyvictimization predicted increased symptom severity. And we also had an interesting finding for one of our covariates. So female gender predicted significantly greater symptom severity than male gender. And then finally, our exploratory analyses revealed that only sexual abuse predicted higher scores on all three of those symptom cluster subscales. And female gender predicted re-experiencing and arousal symptom clusters. No other trauma types predicted any clusters, so these results makes sense in light of our previous findings. All right, so what are some key takeaways from these findings? So our findings indicate that female youth and youth with histories of sexual abuse may be particular, particularly susceptible to PTSD symptoms. And overall, I think these findings ultimately point the importance of accessible assessments so that we can more easily detect these symptoms in at-risk individuals. Screening for trauma and PTSD symptoms can help identify who may be in need of more trauma-focused fo treatments, thus improving treatment outcomes, which is ultimately the goal for clinicians. And children and adolescents who are female or who have experienced sexual abuse should really be on our radars for PTSD screening. So some limitations include that this was a secondary analysis of data, so data collection was not tailored to these specific analyses. 
And in particular, these data were collected before the release of the DSM-5. And the DSM-5 introduced many changes to the PTSD diagnostic criteria. And since then, a newer version of the CPSS was released that aligns with the DSM-5. So for example, the DSM-5 updated their symptom cluster categories a bit. So the original CPSS used here doesn't align with the most up-to-date categorization. Also, multiple studies have consistently linked emotional abuse to PTSD symptoms, but we didn't have any data on emotional abuse for these analyses, and thus we couldn't compare it to the other trauma types we looked at here. In addition, gender was reported using a binary categorization of male or female, and it's possible that some youth in our sample didn't identify with these options. And then finally, the models only explained small proportions of the variance, so factors other than those examined here are likely contributing significantly to PTSD symptom severity. And as far as future directions go, uh, further research should aim to discover the other variables that are contributing to the variance in these symptoms, identify the mechanisms that mediate the effects of sexual abuse and gender on symptoms, and also try to replicate these analyses using the updated CPSS-5. So speaking of the CPSS-5, let's switch gears a little bit so I can tell you about it and how you can access it. So the CPSS was created by Dr. Edna Foa in 2013, and it assesses PTSD symptoms in youth 8 to 18 years old with a history of trauma. It has 27 items and measures symptoms over the past month. And they're, they're both self-report and semi-structured interview versions of the CPSS-5. And I'm gonna focus on the self-report version today because that one can be accessed right away while the interview version must be requested from the author. And the self-report only takes about five to 10 minutes. So it's really quick for the child to complete, which makes it a fast and easy tool to administer. And importantly, the CPSS-5 is a psychometrically sound assessment. And finally, it's completely free to use, making an easy tool to incorporate into your assessment tool belt. So the measure begins with an optional trauma screen portion. And this includes a number of common traumas and then asks the child to record their most bothersome trauma. Then come the PTSD severity items. These items can be summed to produce a total score ranging from zero to 80. And a score of 31 or higher indicates a probable PTSD diagnosis. And the PTSD symptom items make up subscales for each of the updated DSM-5 symptom clusters. And those are intrusion, avoidance, changes in cognition and mood, and arousal and reactivity. And the CPSS-5 concludes with seven impairment questions, and these include several important domains in a child's life, like their social relationships, responsibilities, and general happiness. So tying things back to the research presented earlier, our analyses really demonstrate how the CPSS can be a clinically nuanced tool for PTSD assessment. They show that the CPSS is sensitive to different levels of symptom severity across different trauma types and demographic characteristics, including the groups we found to have a heightened risk, which were youth with sexual abuse histories or with female gender identity. And again, there's a pretty high cost in missing these symptoms and they're really easy to miss. So having this free and quick assessment in your tool belt can help with early identification of these symptoms and help avoid the plot twist of recognizing these symptoms later on during treatment, which allows you to promptly address them and include them in your treatment plan from the start. So as promised, you can download this assessment by scanning this QR code, taking a picture of it for later, or simply Googling the CPSS-5. So I just want to thank you so much for watching this talk. And please don't hesitate to connect with me or email me with any questions you have. Thanks so much.